Hey there everybody, Eric from Outer Limitless coming at you today with another video. Now in today's video we are going to look at this gorgeous hand forge, hand crafted camp axe from Sam Farnworth of Firekeeper Forge. So Sam Farnworth is an up and coming bladesmith who has his own company Firekeeper Forge and the work he is producing is absolutely spectacular. For a guy in his early 20s to be coming out with this fully refined, mature, like top quality, handcrafted, heirloom quality stuff, this is absolutely spectacular. Now, before we go too far, I would like to say thank you very much to Sam, who I've worked with to come up with a collaborative video. So today what we're gonna do, I'm out here in this beautiful wilderness. This is Bushcraft Wonderland. It's my bushcraft camp, and I'm in the process of building this out, and I need good quality tools to get it done. Now this ax is gonna be absolutely instrumental moving forward in my ability to do this work. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna get to work. I'm gonna roll in a whole bunch of of use footage but we're also going to talk to Sam himself about his build process where he's come from where he expects to go and I think you're gonna really enjoy this video but with that said I have a whole bunch to do and a whole bunch to show you and if you're interested in seeing a little bit more about what I'm about to get into do me a favor stay tuned and so as I mentioned this firekeeper forge hand crafted camp axe has a huge chore ahead of it. Now, first things first is I did want to show this while it's still in perfect condition. I have not used this yet, but I did do a few things to get this ready for battle. So what you get with this camp axe is the hand crafted axe head with the handle fully crafted by Sam Farnworth. You also get the mask or sheath, whatever you prefer to call it. I have since added the over strike guard because for me, I just really can't bear to think smashing the handle into anything. So I put the over strike guard on here to protect it. So at this point it is ready for battle. Now this particular ax is in 4140 carbon steel. So that's the first thing. It's wet out here, there's snow on the ground. Generally speaking, I am going to have to pay attention and keep it dry. But other than that, good quality durable steel capable of taking an absolute pounding hand forged by Sam himself just amazing and beautifully done and we'll take a look at it in detail in a minute but the sheath here just full grain gorgeous leather wonderfully done very nicely stitched fully welted just beautifully treated it comes almost waxed which is awesome and then the handle now I asked Sam about this he said he usually uses either hickory or ash a good hard wood and you'll see here this is in my opinion the finest axe handle I have ever held and I haven't held a ton but I've held a number of them it is so perfectly done the handwork, the sanding, the overall shape, the fit, the smell just fully saturated in linseed oil. Look at the top here, how he has done this just perfectly swelled. Nice little wedges driven in there, just so nicely done. And the little details are just amazing. So at this point, let's get into finer detail because I just can't wait to get to work with this camp axe. And so here you'll see the hand forged 4140 head of the axe. Now this is two pounds. So Sam does make a couple of different sizes of axe, really more towards the felling axe, then here the camp axe, and then finally he does have a camp hatchet. But this one here being sort of in the middle, this is the camp axe. So a two pound head, beautifully done. You can see all the wonderful tooling marks, just amazing. And then the little accent all the way around, just how he finishes this off is just premium. And then the edge here, perfectly polished and ground very nicely on a super wicked sharp convex edge. So that's gonna be nice because you will be able to do a lot of carving tasks, yet at the same time, it's gonna be good and durable for the chopping. So just beautifully done. Now looking at the top of the ax here, you will see that it has his logo stamped in there beautifully. 
And if you look at the shape of the bit, it is perfectly shaped with a little bit wider cheeks to allow for some good splitting action. So this isn't going to be like the finest carver, but this is going to be right in the middle ground, that sweet spot where you are going to be able to do some carving, yet you're going to be able to do a real nice job with the splitting tasks. Again, you can see the top of the handle coming through nicely with the wedges perfectly in place couple of wooden wedges and then also you have a steel spike going through to hold everything together. Rolling this around to the back side, look at that just beautifully done with the pommel end. That is just nice and squared off and just a gorgeous finish. This axe has, I would say in my opinion, that sort of medieval look to it. It's kind of like an old battle axe style. Just looks awesome. I am totally pumped about this and I think Sam's doing a magnificent job. Now just real quick checking out the fitment of the handle through the eye of the head. Absolutely perfect. No gaps. Perfectly shaped and if you notice how he hand carved and necked down the top of the handle to fit it through it just has a really cool just awesome awesome look now because of my over strike guard at this point you can't see all of the detail i tried to nestle that guard up as high as i could to protect the handle but you can see still on the back side here just beautifully done amazing amazing work and looking at the shape of the handle again just wonderfully done perfectly perfectly shaped and smoothed and sanded the grain structure on this is outstanding now I don't know if all of Sam's handles come out as nice as mine did, but if they do, everybody's in for a treat. I don't think you could get a better oriented grain on a handle perfectly vertical there, so spanning the width of the handle just perfectly. So again, Sam is paying attention to all the details, including his selection of the lumber, just very, very nicely done. And again, check out the quality of that finish. Gorgeous. This particular stain being the dark brown, you can get more of a honey color if you prefer, but for me, I like this dark brown. That is absolutely awesome. And finally here, getting into details on the mask, here you'll see a nice shiny chrome rivet. The beautiful welting on this, just again, nicely done. Perfectly sanded, nicely formed. The stitching is perfect. Now I can tell that Sam seems to be using a, I would say like industrial leather stitching sewing machine, not a problem. In fact, that's gonna help him with his production and over time, his ability to keep things nice and uniform. So very, very nicely done. I think he's doing a great job, not just with the ax itself, but with the leather work, that is just beautiful. Nice and thick, well crafted, perfectly stitched. The dye color, even. And the final finish, he puts a wax on it to protect it. That's just an awesome touch. Hey, hey, Sam, what's happening, man? Hey, dude, how's it going? Doing very good. Well, hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming onto the channel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it a lot. So this is exciting for everybody watching. This is Sam Farnworth from Firekeeper Forge. Now, Sam, we got to talking. I caught on to your Instagram and immediately fell in love with your work. Uh, for everybody watching, so Sam, you are a craftsman, um, an artisan. You are a bladesmith of some very fine and what I'm going to call functional artwork. So first and foremost, beautiful work, man. Ah, thank you. Uh, you are a maker of handcrafted and hand forged knives, axes, and other tools. Uh, you are the owner and operator of Firekeeper Forge, which is located in Bend, Oregon. Yep. And uh, you have a website, firekeeperforge.com, and you also operate the Facebook and Instagram page under the name Firekeeper Forge. Yes, indeed. So thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on the channel. Now, I have already set up this video. Um, I have already brought people sort of up to speed with what you've been making, but I wanna get people deeper into the process here today, get them to understand you a little bit, maybe where you've come from, where you currently are and where you wanna go. So I think we're gonna take people through a nice little journey here. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> cool, so, all right, well, you know, Sam, when I look back at my life, you know, I do 
really believe that, you know, I've had a lot of fortune due to my sort of family upbringing and the different opportunities that my family has provided for me. Now, Mm -hmm. you're sitting here today with a lot of successes, but I think it happened on one specific moment when your family did provide an opportunity for you. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So when I was 13, kind of on a whim, my mother signed me and my twin brother up for this uh, kind of three-part metalworking class. And uh, part of it was cast aluminum and welding. And then another part was blacksmithing. So that was kind of the first introduction into kind of metalwork as a whole. And then throughout kind of my early teens, I kind of had different interests in the metalwork field and then was finally able to Uh, I was in this uh, nature program where we were building like shelters and friction fire and all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, I had seen some of the folks there actually put handles on knives and I thought that was really cool, but I kind of wanted to do the whole process. So just went on YouTube and decided to to learn how to do it myself and kind of being previously exposed to metalwork and blacksmithing and stuff previously kind of gave me the tools I needed to kind of start working on kind of the more custom metalwork and knives and axes and all that sort of thing. So, well, that's, that's pretty incredible. So I guess in essence, you've had a basic fundamental training, but not really substantial formal training yet. Mm -hmm. At this point, you're running an entire shop. You're doing all of this elaborate and detailed and extremely high level work. I mean, to me, that's, that's, pretty incredible. So um, now you're in your early 20s. Um, Moving forward, I mean, you've been practicing and honing your craft for less than 10 years. But considering how refined and mature your work is, I mean, at such a young age, it's pretty incredible. I mean, what has that been like for you? And, and, And is this full time for you now? And I mean, kind of where are you with this journey? Yeah, so as of now, I am full time, have been for about three years. And I think kind of one thing, I think the non-formal training really accelerated and helped me for different reasons, but also held me back in other regards. It gave me a, what I have soon, or what I've realized to be an unrealistic expectation of how things should be, because a picture can look absolutely flawless and perfect. However, you can see something in person and maybe that's not the case. So I think kind of learning online and seeing pictures and not necessarily interacting in person with what I was striving for gave me a really high degree of what I wanted to shoot for. And that's kind of been the driving force of trying to make things the best that I can instead of like going to a table at Blade Show and realizing your mirror polish has scratches all over it. That just, you can't (laughs) tell that just from a picture. So I think that unrealistic expectation of, you know, something being handmade and maybe having imperfections um, gave me the strive to make it as perfect as I can. And those little kind of inconsistencies and imperfections really just frustrate me to no end because I either I'm not good enough in that moment or, you know, for whatever reason they're there. And those always just make me want to do better, even though they're really frustrating. Well, I, I love the, the handmade look and feel. I actually personally really like the character that comes with it. You know, mm-hmm. you, you even look at, you know, production knives. And to be honest, you know, they have inclusions and imperfections. But when you've done it by hand and with a hand tool and through this process of bringing raw materials to a finished product, to me, I don't look at those as imperfections, even though as you, who somebody who's, a craftsman and an artisan and trying to hone that craft. I'm glad you're looking at the details, but at the same time, I don't look at them as imperfections. I look at that as part of the process. Yeah. It's definitely, that's been something I've been really trying to kind of just come to terms with like, well, I'm going to do my best and it's probably not going to be perceived in my eyes as flawless or perfect, but a, nobody will probably notice and B, nobody probably cares and C, some people might like it. So, <laughs> <It's> just, yeah. <laughs> nice. So uh, let, let me ask you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, some uh, bushcrafting and stuff like that. Like apart from being in the shop, what do you do kind of on the side that helps to influence your, your work and your designs and really why you're making the tools that you are making? Yeah. So I think coming from kind of learning before making knives and axes and stuff, learning kind of those more nature-based skills was really good because it 
really gave me an idea of what was important with making that sort of thing. And I feel I do all sorts of stuff, but the main bread and butter to what I am doing are kind of those outdoor wilderness tools. So I think coming from that background, knowing what tool needs to go where and what and how that needs to be made, I think coming from that background really helped. So um, yeah, just making things light enough, strong enough, shape the correct way is something that you can't really just know without actually having kind of that dirt time previously. And I think, yeah, it's same with like any making anything, you kind of got to know what it's used for to be able to make it and then improve upon it. So I feel like um, that's super helpful. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because, and believe me, uh, and actually I'm not an ax guy. Um, uh -huh. quote unquote. And I know there's ax guys. Cause believe yeah. me, when I do a video about an ax, I get the most criticism I could get on any video and the most hate from uh -huh. pure ax guys. What do you think about the ax guys? I feel like they need to find something else to complain about and <laughs> kind of fucking hobby. Excuse my language. <laughs> yeah. People live their life. <laughs> uh huh. My technique isn't quite right. I'm going to kill myself and chop my whole leg off. You idiot. And like, Oh my God. Oh, the piece but, of wood was cut. Doesn't matter how I get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah. um, but uh, no, I did want to ask, do you have any help? um at all or is this 100 percent you right now this is 100 percent me um i've played with the idea recently of kind of getting an apprentice to do kind of more of the basic tasks to where i could kind of up production and kind of the more niche techniques and stuff to go into making my stuff but as of now it's all me and it's uh it's been good it definitely is hard to increase the amount of output with that kind of mentality though so definitely playing around with different ideas with that Yep. And uh, what happened to your brother? He didn't take to it. He just, he was kind of more into like the computer stuff and games and kind of took a more traditional route with all kind of his schooling and stuff. And he's uh, just gotten into carpentry work and is super amped on that. So he's kind of getting, getting into it, but um, definitely not super into the metal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's uh, to each their own, but uh, yeah. I think when we look at the, uh, the ax handles in a little bit, maybe you will have a little bit of help from your uh, carpenter brother there. Yeah, that'd be cool for sure. But uh, Not that you need it. I'm just saying, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, well, let's move forward here. Um, let's talk about your knives. So taking a look at your knives, you make, custom one-offs. So if you were a customer and you wanted to come to Firekeeper Forge and said, Sam, I got a design, you could come to Sam. He'd analyze your design, work with you and make yep. a custom design. Now you also have what I would call uh, small batch production runs of a number of your models. So mm -hmm. talk about some of those knives, both the custom knives, but then also your personal designs and mm -hmm. you know what are you currently working on and what batches might we see coming up yeah for sure so the custom stuff is really great because it really exposes me to all different kinds of things that i maybe wouldn't otherwise have tried um now part of that is there's for some projects quite a steep learning curve so usually the times of me messing up and starting over are higher than not so from a financial aspect the custom stuff is a little bit uh, more challenging to make enough to where I can live the life I want to live, but also um, charging a, a good price for the customer to, for what I'm providing is kind of a tricky balance with that. Um, but it's really cool because I basically started just doing custom stuff and it was able to come up with all my production designs and have a better idea of what A, people like, and then B, because of all the different skills I learned be able to branch off into other things like chef's knives, not just wilderness knives and eventually, you know, other cutting tools and all sorts of stuff. So I'm still, I do still take custom orders and I'm doing a slightly different ordering format now to still have them um, as part of my workload, but make it to where there's a faster turnaround time for the customer, uh, but make it to where I'm not six, eight months out and just getting overwhelmed with things, but I'm still keeping them on and uh, still love doing them because it exposes me to all this fun, creative stuff that I might otherwise not have tried. And then for the production work, um, I basically just started doing that this year and it's been really good. I think I've finally kind of had enough interest in what I'm making and enough following to where I can really start moving blades 
um, at a rate where I'm comfortable and they're not just sitting on a shelf for months. And uh, I really enjoy doing those because there's a lot more room for making money on my end, which is, which is great, <laughs> as well as people who order them can then get them in two to three days and I just ship them immediately. Um, so that's been kind of the direction I'm heading a little bit more, um, just because that's kind of what's been feeling good. And it's nice to kind of switch things up after doing just years and years of custom stuff. I was going to say, I think that makes a lot of sense to have a core business based on some repeatable results. It gets you in a rhythm. You can punch out a, a number of blades. It, it gets you uh, a volume on hand that actually, you know, at that point helps keep the money rolling, gets you some cash flow and can help you take on those other projects. And especially where the custom knives do have a level of risk. You have mm -hmm. risk in your success in actually making a blade, but then also in the customer's sort of impression of what they've got. And yeah. I would say that if you're making your own personal model, somebody's mm -hmm. going to get it and they accept it for what it is. But when you're making yeah. a custom for somebody else, they have a lot of criticism in there and that could be difficult. It can be. And thankfully that hasn't really happened too much. Uh, over the past years, but even when it does happen, it's a great opportunity to kind of learn from that, even though you might not feel the best in the moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So definitely it's nice to be at a point where people are coming to me for what I can provide instead of like, oh, I saw this knife online. Can you make it? And like, well, yeah, sure. But, you know, I want to be producing what I want and kind of when I want. And that's kind of the direction I'm headed, which, which I'm nice. Into. So uh, what, what batches do you have coming up? You got anything in the works right now? Yeah. So at the end of this month, um, February 28th, I'm going to be launching four Serbian chef's knives, which are a really popular design right now. And then four of a very popular design of mine called the Bard Owl Bushcrafter, which is kind of a general five inch blade all around hard use camp knife. Uh, you could split your kindling with it. You could skin a deer. You could do all sorts of stuff with it. So going to be doing four of each of those designs. And then uh, we'll be, I'm, those are the only knives at the production schedule right now. I'm trying to keep it two to three months out and just to kind of play with this new idea of a production schedule. And then I'm going to be doing knives and axes kind of every other month to kind of keep things interesting. Nice. And yeah. I've noticed, uh, you know, I, I, pay close attention to you now on uh, Instagram, I noticed that you've been getting some new equipment. Do you find that now that you're getting more into some of the production work that you had to tailor your equipment and your shop to handle that process work? Definitely. It's definitely different making one thing versus 20, because when you make 20, you see every single thing that's taking way too long. So <laughs> I've definitely just, even just making tooling, you can't buy a lot of this stuff because it's so specific. So just making like the version one of this tool that I think will go faster than I'm like, okay, something's wrong with this and then version two. So it's been a really good learning experience to figure out what parts of the process I can improve upon. And it's cool to look at it as a whole like that. So if one knife takes six hours, it's like, okay, how do I get that down to five hours? I can do this, this, and this. And if I do 10 of them at once, it'll take this amount of time for each blade. So it's it's been a cool thing to analyze and kind of learn from. And that's definitely something I wouldn't have done just making one or two blades at a time for custom work. Um, oh, that's, that's awesome. I think that's a, a skill that early in your career is going to pay dividends in the long run. So, I mean, shave an hour here, shave an hour there. Those hours yeah. are going to add up fast and especially over the course of a career. So, <laughs> uh, Nice, man. All right. Well, we've talked a little bit about your knives. Um, what brought me here in the first place was your axes. So you did just finish a small batch production run. Um, that production run had your hatchet design, your mm -hmm. felling axe, your camp axe. And since then, I noticed you've been uh, playing around a little bit with some tomahawks. So uh, how many uh, axes did you make in that particular run? And I think you started to talk about when we'd expect to see a next batch, but talk a little bit about uh, your axes and, and what we may come to expect. Yeah. So that last, I've been kind of running them as a pre-order. So I'd, I've come to learn with all the custom stuff is people like to choose options. So I've kind of taken that knowledge and turned it into these axes to where you can choose, you know, the head style, you can choose the handle finish. And eventually I'd love to do more with that. 
Um, but this last uh, pre-order or small production run was about 16 axes altogether. Um, we did uh, six camp axes, five small felling axes, and five hatchets. And uh, they were by far the best production pre-order I've done so far. I've been making axes pretty seriously for about a year now, which has been just a crazy learning experience with all of them. And I'm really happy with the ones I just turned out. But as with any batch work, you can see one's a little bigger than the other. And it's just, you know, all these little, I guess, inconsistencies, you could call them, that I'm trying to improve upon. Um, but they turned out pretty well, and I'm really excited about them. And um, on March 10th, I'm going to be launching uh, another pre-order production run. And we're going to be doing the Mark II kind of design. So all the head designs are going to be tweaked a little bit to where there's a little bit less grinding and kind of forceful movement of the steel involved. So it's going to be a little bit more of a natural shape from forging. And then the handle shapes are going to be a little bit curvier. And uh, we're going to be launching a couple new designs, such as a kindling hatchet and a uh, splitting axe as well. So haven't done those two before. So that'll be fun. Interesting. Interesting. Nice, man. Nice. Well, so I do have the axe that you built for me sitting right here. Um, yeah. So this is the camp axe. Again, yes. I have already introduced this to the audience, but I did want to ask some questions now that I have you here. So first is, uh, you know, this is built with a two pound head, uh, mm -hmm. 4140 steel. And then, yep. I, you know, I was curious about the handle because you do offer different handle materials and also some different finishes. And mm -hmm. you actually just spoke specifically about the shape of the head. And yeah. so, you know, I have one particular style and you have another mm -hmm. style out there. So talk to me a little bit about your steel selection and your material selection, because believe me, I realize you're not a metallurgist, right? But mm -hmm. you have to come and approach a tool with your knowledge of one, your intended use. So being kind of an outdoorsy guy and a bushcrafty guy, you have an understanding of that. But mm -hmm. two, as somebody that works with the medium, you need to understand the properties of that steel to get the proper output that you're looking for with your tools and with your own brute force to mm -hmm. get this to shape the way that it wants. So talk to me a little bit about your material selection and what that means for you. Yeah, so for steel, um, there are so many different kinds of steel out there. And the reason why steel is such a widely used material is because you can add different alloying elements. You can add different amounts of carbon. You can add all these different things and then heat them and cool them in different ways and work them in different ways to get different properties out of them. So for axes, it's 4140 um, tool steel, uh, which is the point or the the 40 at the end refers to the amount of carbon. And a lot of steels are like that. Usually some number in there refers to the amount of carbon. So these have about, I'm gonna get real nerdy for a sec. These have about 0.4% carbon in them versus knife steel, which is usually closer to about that 1% mark. So what the carbon does is it allows the steel to go from soft to very hard by cooling it very fast. So because these are have a lower carbon content than a knife, they're going to be much tougher. So for an ax that you're beating through, who knows what, we want these to be as tough as possible. However, because it is able to harden, that's where you get that razor sharp edge and that edge holding capacity. So picking the right steel for the job is super important. And 4140 uh, is just insanely tough. It's pretty easy to sharpen and uh, takes a, I can get them razor sharp. So it seems to be just the perfect steel for all basically impact tools. Good choice, man. And um, I'll be honest, I wasn't too familiar with 4140. Now I know, you know, 5160 and um, mm -hmm. 1095 and, you know, a lot of other carbon steels. I mm -hmm. knew this was carbon steel. You know, you can, sometimes you can kind of tell by looking and at the same time, you know, you said it and I did a little bit of research. Um, mm -hmm. But what I noticed, and again, going back to razor sharp, not only did you get this razor sharp, but you put a nice convex edge. So it is just a nicely rounded convex edge right to that perfect, perfect apex on the grind there. So um, to me, that that's going to also aid in durability. So now you're not only getting that razor sharp slicing capability, but you're getting that nice rounded wedge where you're going to have a, a nice 
tough and durable edge, easy to strop, easy to field strop, um, but it's not like a V grind, you know, this is more of a convex. So yeah. uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so steel is an important part of whatever you're making. However, A, heat treating it to however you need it to behave and B, having the correct edge geometry specifically for edge tools is another huge part, which I feel like people often look over and don't really prioritize. Um, Cause I could probably get a mild steel ax to cut just as well as that. Now it probably wouldn't hold that edge for as long, but because of the other properties, I could probably do it. However, that convex edge, it makes it to where it is a much more robust edge. Cause there's a lot more meat right behind that cutting edge. And what it also does for cutting and splitting instead of, the um, ax, which instead of an ax that might have like a V grind on it, which could potentially get stuck, it kind of goes in and then splits the wood off. So if you're felling, it kind of splits these chunks out, making cutting more efficient. So it's kind of the best of every single world into that one grind. Um, and it's so far been proven, proven really great for me so far. I think it's really beautiful how nicely you polish. It's like a, a sanded satin finish going uh -huh. into the hammered work there now mm -hmm. is this just natural scale or do you add anything to add a little bit of a patina or i mean i know that obviously once you're grinding that's mm -hmm. starting to uh reveal the the bare steel underneath and then mm -hmm. i noticed too that you did that around all of your edges so i yeah. mean you have incredibly and beautifully highlighted and accentuated all of the curves around the entire ax head. And that was the main thing that immediately <laughs> drew me to these. When I saw that, I was like, that's next level stuff. Cause people don't always think of those little details. And when I saw that, I was like, this kid's paying attention. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I had no idea that was such a, a nice feature of them. Um, but yeah, kind of that kind of scaly look is all the, marks and stuff from forging which i really like i think it's really cool to have that polished steel blend into seeing kind of how the tool was born and all that you know grit and fire scale and all this stuff flowing into the refineness of you know a ground and polished edge i think that's that's the whole reason it's called brute to forge that kind of style um that's kind of what got me into knives and axes and all sorts of stuff nice no it is it is beautiful and just Nicely done into the pole. I mean, just looks awesome. Nice and squared off. Just has a real beautiful look. And what I've noticed too about your handle mm -hmm. and going into some of the ergonomics is your handle is slightly larger than other axes that I've held. And now I haven't held a ton. I'm putting mm -hmm. a disclaimer. I'm not yeah. an axe guy. <laughs> but I mean, my, my closest... I would say comparison is the Grants Forest Brook. Uh, this is the small forest ax. They are quite similar in a lot of ways. Now, this is a considerably smaller ax than yours, um, mm -hmm. both in handle size and then the overall like head geometry. And I think maybe even the weight. So you've created a reasonably compact ax with a heavy hitting head and a nice oversized handle. I mean, the, the way you have flared this out and the way that it indexes is, is magnificent. Not to mention, this is probably the finest sanding job you could ever put. It, it is so phenomenally well done. It's unbelievable. So um, yeah, man, it, this is a sick piece of work. That's awesome. Yeah. Um... As for the handles, I, since not having any formal training, all of it's done by feel. So I, all the handles I make, unless somebody's like, I have an enormous hand, can you make it a little bigger? It's, I'm just, here, I got one here. I'm just holding them and seeing, okay, if it's like a little too fat down here, I can feel that and just take a little bit of material off. Or if, you know, when you're holding it like this, making sure wherever you're gripping it, wherever your hand is going to slide, it's a comfortable transition. So that's been the big thing for me. And that's what I tell people who ask me, like, how do you shape handles? I mean, just feel it and see, you'll know if it's right. And it might be subtle, 
but you'll know if it's wrong too. So that's every single one, even if, you know, it's all six of the camp axes, every single one of them, I got them close. And then it was all just by hand. Like, okay, there's a little fat spot here. And I get rid of that. And then that's kind of what takes so long about them is because I'm making each individual one exactly how it needs to be instead of just choosing, you know, one and templating it out exactly because they're all going to feel just a little bit different. So that's kind of my feelings on kind of the handle ergonomics as well as just, I don't care what other makers do or what, you know, I don't care if their handles are a little thinner because I'm making it to where I think they're comfortable and I don't have freakishly large hands or anything. So that's a pretty good general idea of what most people are going to feel and that and when it's right, it's right. And I don't care what anybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, I think you sent me your nicest one. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out pretty good. It, it's pretty awesome, man. It's it's pretty awesome. So, well, Sam, man, sick work, dude. I got to say, like, I barely even know you, and I'm proud of you, dude. Oh, like, thank you. I, like, looking at this, like, this is this is stuff to be seriously proud of i mean you're you are you're you're a craftsman uh you're you're an artist through listening to you you know i'm not i'm not i'm not saying perfectionist in a bad way i'm saying you know you strive for perfection which mm -hmm. is which is really the nature and the heart of a true craftsman a, a craftsman takes pride in their work a craftsman has the feel and the touch and they know how to use the tools to manipulate the medium. They know how to use their hands to identify potential flaws. And they're, they're mm -hmm. listening, sometimes even smelling or, or yeah. I, I'm not going to say you're tasting this thing, but you probably <laughs> do. <laughs> so um, specifically, I had to make sure it was just right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, man, um, you know, I guess the only thing I can say at this point uh what's next for firekeeper forge and for sam farnworth what is next what is next that's a great question i think kind of moving forward with kind of that pre-order business plan and kind of more production work is where i'm headed and i'm at a point where i have enough interest in what i'm doing to where that's profitable enough for me to continue doing and can really help me improve all steps of the process for custom work as well so I think that's the direction I'm kind of mainly focusing on and doing both knives and axes. And I'd love to get into even more tools because I have so many things I want to do. I have to prioritize what I actually can do feasibly and um, what I want to do and all that. And then kind of on the side, I'm going to be doing a couple of customs a month to keep learning new skills. And if somebody just wants something super crazy and super personal, them uh, be able to have that option open as well. I don't like turning people away. So um I will, I'll take all the business I can get and try to accommodate as many things as I can. So that's, that's where I want to head. Nice. Well, again, congratulations. And for everybody watching Sam Farnworth, Firekeeper Forge, definitely take a look at his Instagram. Sam, one of the things that you do, that's really fun. I mean, you will put the camera on live and you'll just go to town in the shop. You'll actually be making things. And not only do people get to watch you making them, but you're interactive, you're sharing part of the experience, you're talking about how you're shaping the handles and what you're doing and each step along the way and why you're making little refinements and all those sort of touch points that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We get to see that happen live. So for everybody watching, it is very fun. And uh, Sam, man, keep up the great work. Thank you. And if anyone's in the Bend, Oregon area, the next couple of months, I'm gonna be offering classes. So if anyone's interested in doing it hands-on, let me know. Ah, <laughs> oh, I'm jealous now, man. <laughs> I would love, I'll take you up on that one of these days. Right. I'm going to show up and knock, 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 I'm here. All right. I'll welcome you. <laughs> All right, Sam. Well, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. All right. My pleasure. See ya. Well, so, all right, guys, there you have it. A look at this beautiful hand forged, hand crafted piece of heirloom quality functional artwork from Sam Farnworth of Firekeeper Forge. Sam, you're a genius, kid. You are really incredible at what you do. So I hope you keep it up and always the best of luck, man, because you deserve it. And for everybody watching, if I could give you one bit of advice, 
I would suggest you go pick yourself up something from Sam like now while you can still afford his work because I have a feeling that he's going to continue to grow and he's going to have a great career ahead of himself if he keeps up what he's doing and this is just the beginning so this axe is going to be absolutely instrumental in my ability to continue to move forward on this shelter build so if you are interested in seeing more work with sam's beautiful camp axe i suggest following along with my bushcraft wonderland series it is a mini series that i'm continuing to push forward with and as long as i can keep coming out here i think by the end of this i'm gonna have a pretty good shelter to show for it so a lot of work today some great work with this axe sam i hate to say it man but i got the tiniest little tiny ding there i'm gonna have to strop out when i get back and a oh, tiny little boo-boo on my handle but uh it was done with love in the forest so i'll take it so all right guys thanks for stopping by i hope you like what you saw i hope you found it a little bit informative if you like what you saw please like share and subscribe and as always thanks for stopping by take care now i'll see you soon